I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm talking garden birds with Kate Risley, Garden Bird Watch organiser at the British Trust for Ornithology. Kate talks us through the trends that have occurred in our garden bird populations over the past 40 years, what and when to feed them, diseases that are on the rise and how you can attract more birds in your garden. I started by asking Kate if she could explain her role at the BTO. Yeah, sure. So I uh, organised the BTO survey that's called Garden Bird Watch and the BTO run a lot of different surveys which are getting people to record birds um, out in the countryside, um, in woodlands, in farmland, and obviously Garden Bird Watch is the survey where people record the birds in their gardens. Um, And this is obviously um, really interesting to people because they want to know all about the birds that they're seeing every day, you know, in their own from their own homes. Um, But it's also really interesting for us to know about how birds use the space around our homes and how what we do affects them, because obviously this is where our actions have, you know, a really big impact on on birds and wildlife. Mm, So you don't actually need a garden? The BTO run a lot of different surveys. Um, so there's the breeding bird survey, there's the wetland bird survey, there's bird track, which is just about recording birds anywhere. Um, and the garden bird watch is obviously about recording the birds in your garden. So I run, um, we have a little team of us, um, of people who, um, get, you know, get people involved in the survey. We want a membership. So, um, people sign up and it's, they pay 17 pounds per year to to keep the survey running and we do a magazine which goes out to people all about garden birds Um, and obviously we process all the data that comes back in from those garden bird watchers Um, you know about 13,000 people across the country um, who record the birds um, in their garden and just send in weekly lists Um, and then we we run um, a program of research using those using that data set uh, to try and help answer some of these questions that are really interesting to us about how we're affecting these birds that we see. I had some really interesting birds in my garden the other day and I'd never seen them before. They weren't particularly spectacular to look at, but they, there were certainly ones I hadn't seen before. Um, so I looked on the internet and tried to do a bit of ID and then I went to Twitter and asked for help. Um, but it, I think they were warblers of some sort and people were kind of saying, oh, well, they could be chiff chaffs, they could be this warbler and that mm-hmm. warbler. And I thought, mm-hmm. oh, I'd be hopeless at this. But can anyone <laughs> participate? Is that a barrier if you're not brilliant at bird watching? No, certainly not. So we do sort of give a lot of information to people about how to identify the common birds that are likely to see. Um, I have to say, telling the difference between a chiff chaff and a willow warbler is actually quite difficult um, and is, you know, that's fairly, that's a sort of reasonable level of bird watching. Um, and, you know, I definitely, I think what we expect from people who, um, what we ask people is that can you record and identify the birds that you normally see in your garden so um that would normally be you know your blue tits your blackbirds your uh chaffinches and green finches those kind of things and then obviously through doing the survey getting involved um you know we, we actually give people a book when they join all about um different birds um people do often end up learning a lot more and learning about things like yes how to tell the difference between maybe these rarer species that might turn up you know this time of year is when birds are migrating so all these migrant birds tend to pass through and will pop up in gardens for a few weeks in the year but when they're not normally in gardens at other times so yeah they're definitely do you get a few, a few unusual visitors at this time of year mm, it was lovely to see them um mm. but so if i wanted to take part um how would i actually do it in my garden so what we ask people to do is on a weekly basis so um over the course of a week you don't, you don't have to do it every week um but a lot of people do do it every week or you can do it as and when but just send in a list of the birds that you've seen that week so um you start the week on a on a sunday um, and as you go through the week you might um you know record the birds that you see um if you want to give a bit more detail you can tell us um how many you see together at one time um so obviously if you see one blackbird every day uh you won't count 
seven blackbirds over the week, you'll just count it. You only saw one at a time. Um, whereas if you see um, four goldfinches together on a feeder, um, that would be four. Um, so that's the maximum that you know are in your garden at any one time. Um, you can either do it just over the course of the week um, to say, you know, this is what I've seen. Um, or you can pick a particular time and say, right, Saturday morning is I'm going to sit down for half an hour. And that will be my that will be my bird watch. And it's, we really leave it up to people um, how much time they spend um, sort of looking at their garden, because obviously you can imagine people have very, very variable amounts of time available to do that. Uh, we only ask that people are consistent so that they don't one week spend all day watching their bird feeders uh, all day, every day, and another week only spend half an hour, because obviously you're not really going to pick up a sense of changes in that garden from such different um sort of amounts of effort you've put in um so whether people choose to spend a lot of time or a little time it's just you know make that the same every time they send a list in because what we're really looking at is how um you know in one garden or in one type of garden how the the patterns change over the course of the year so what kind of percentage of gardens might see these these birds at one time of year compared to another time of year so picking up those rhythms really that's what we're interested in doing Mm -hmm. I mean in my garden I think probably I have peak times of the day for the birds say around two o'clock there's just nothing Mm. doing and then earlier in the morning and later in the afternoon they'll they'll all come Mm. back in Do, do you need to be fairly consistent with the time that you do it or is there a bit of flexibility there yeah um so when I record the birds in my garden, um, I tend to just keep an eye at the window whenever I'm in my living room uh, because I know that I spend roughly the same time in my living room one week to the next. So um, if I'm there early morning having my breakfast, um, that's when I'd look out the window and, and, um, and look at the birds. You don't have to get too worried really about um, what time you do it. Um, if you feel like a good time to watch the birds or to record the birds that you see is when there are lots of birds there, then um, then then that's that seems like a good idea to do it at that time and just to sort of do the same thing um, at different you know in different weeks so that what you're not doing is um, you know one week you'll look out of your window at when there are no birds there and can try and compare that to another week when you recorded at a time when there were lots of birds there. So you mentioned about um, using the data um, Mm -hmm. that you collect. So why is that important and and how do you make use of that data? Yeah, so we have a lot of um, people, sort of researchers working at the BTO um, who analyse the data. And we also collaborate with other organisations, with universities, um, academic institutions to make that data set available. And essentially, the big questions that we're asking are along the lines of how are our own actions as gardeners, um, as people who are feeding the birds, um, how are they affecting our wildlife? So that's the big the big questions. But obviously, that's broken down into a lot of very specific research topics. And one of the things we've been looking at a lot recently is the effects of bird feeding specifically. So, for example, um, so one thing that we've been looking at is um, over a, a long period of time, so over about 40 years, um, how has the food that we've been putting out been changing? How have the bird populations in our gardens been changing as a result of that food? And do, can we tell anything about how that's affected our bird populations in general? And there are definitely some uh, indications that um, the food that we've put out has actually driven changes. Um, for example, black caps, which is another kind of warbler, um, they use gardens in the winter. We're actually seeing a lot more of them than we did in previous decades. Um, and actually, they've evolved a whole new migration route. Um, so they come here from a continental Europe in the winter. Um, and we've shown using our data that that's actually been, you know, one of the key drivers of that change has been due to actually bird food being put out in gardens. Um, so that's been really interesting. Um, another, that's a positive change. Um, another area of of interest for us is more of a negative change and it's about diseases um so we've looked at how um, birds give each other transmit diseases at bird feeders and how that's affected our populations as well yeah greenfinches used to be a very common bird in gardens but um in the last 
um, decade or so, they've really declined due to disease. And we, um, you know, using the data that people have sent to us, we, we, we think that, um, that they're, they've congregated bird feeders and that's actually been a really important, um, factor in the spread of that disease, um, and has really, um, had an effect on their populations. So that's a, a negative way in which bird feeding might have affected our birds as well as the positive ways. Mm, yeah, I had that in my garden earlier this year. I'd never seen it before. Um, mm. And it was it was horrendous. Does that also affect sparrows? Yes, they do. Sparrows do get um, trichomonosis. Uh, they also get other diseases as well. Um, so there's that's just one of the diseases that wild birds can get. Um, normally, um, birds have been living with these diseases for, you know, obviously over evolutionary time. And um, even though individual birds might get sick, um, it doesn't necessarily affect their populations. So it's only really been in the green finches that we found this really surprising, you know, a new disease coming into the population, causing an epidemic and actually um, affecting their population very um, substantially. Mm. When you say you're kind of monitoring the effects of garden bird feeders, are you asking people to record that information? And do the majority of people who take part in the garden bird watch actually have bird feeders in their garden? Is that what you're finding? Yes. Um, most, the vast majority of people who take part in the survey do feed the birds. Uh, you don't have to feed the birds to, to do, to record your garden birds. Um, but it just so happens that obviously most of the people who send in records to us also feed their birds. Um, and, um, and yes, we do ask people to just say, you know, when they send in a list, what kinds of bird food that they put out. Yeah. And if we are choosing to feed our birds, um, obviously that there's a hygiene issue, but what are some of the best things that we can feed them? Do we need to be, uh, changing that depending on the season, um, and, and actually, is there anything we shouldn't be feeding? Um, in terms of things that you shouldn't feed, um, really the only things that are actively harmful are um, obviously processed foods. So things that <coughs> people would eat that aren't good for us anyway. Um, so anything with salt in um, is not a good thing. Um, anything processed. Um, anything that's got um, that's soft, sticky fat. Um, at room temperature because of that not because it's necessarily bad for them to eat but it gets onto their feathers um so any fats that put out have to be the hard fats at um you know the temperature they'll be in the garden they have to be solid and not sticky um so they're the real no-nos um apart from that um really the, the things that we tend to focus on now are um seeds so natural seeds so sunflower seeds um niger seeds um and anything that's sort of quite quite energy rich and quite close to their natural food source peanuts um you know they're always a safe bet um and then in the winter in particular um fat, fat balls fat pellets those kind of things that are hard fats um are really valuable energy source in the breeding season, when birds have uh, chicks that they're feeding, um, they tend to feed their chicks in nature. They feed their chicks on insects. Most, most birds do uh, because these are high in protein and these are what the young birds need to grow and to grow their feathers. So sometimes people choose to put out uh, dried mealworms and things like that that are, are higher in protein in the breeding season. Uh, but the thing to remember about bird feeding is that um, all of these foods that we put in our gardens are always supplementary. Um, birds are generally feeding naturally um, as well and they're coming into the gardens and making use of these food sources as and when they need them um, people do get quite um, people do think that the birds are only eating the food that they're putting out and, and worry sometimes about giving you know making sure they've got a balanced diet uh, but this isn't really the same as feeding you know your, your pet dog or your pet cat where you're providing you know the, the vast majority of that animal's food um, they are they are feeding themselves on a natural diet of the things that they need. So in the summer, that will be insects. Um, and they're really coming to use bird feeders for that additional supplementary food to top up their diet. So that's something to bear in mind, really. Um, I think there's one other thing about seeds is that you can buy a lot of seed mixes. Um, and and there's some of them have got lots of seeds that birds really like are very high quality <laughs> others tend to be maybe a bit bulked out with um lower 
you know, seeds that birds don't like as much but are maybe cheaper to produce. And so really the way to to assess this is when you feed the birds, do they sit on the feeder just throwing it all out onto the floor and only picking out one or two bits of seed? Um, or do they eat most of what's in the feeder? Because obviously it's a bit of a, a waste of money if you're putting the food out and it's got lots of um, lots of kind of bulky cereals that they don't really eat. Um, that's not really a it's not it's not harmful to the birds, but it's just something to be aware of if you're buying a seed mix. Um, and I think the other thing that I mentioned about buying bird food is just being really aware that you're buying it from. Um, somewhere that's properly handling it and storing it because um, things can go moldy. So, for example, peanuts, you can get um, toxins when they go moldy in storage. Um, that's the most well-known um, problem. And this, these toxins are actually very, very poisonous to birds. So um, you wouldn't necessarily want to buy very cheap peanuts that you don't, you know, that aren't from somewhere that, um, that takes care about storing them and testing them appropriately. So just being, um, we recommend that people buy their bird food from what we say is a, a reputable supplier, but I'm not really sure what that means in practice. But. <laughs> yeah. So if I was feeding my birds, um, I feed my birds in more in the winter. Um, mm-hmm. And then in the spring, like you said, I tend to put out sunflower hearts and then mealworms, that kind of thing. And then in mm-hmm. the summer, I don't put as much out because it got to the point where I didn't think that they were visiting the feeders as much. But then I mm-hmm. worry, oh, well, you know, have they come to rely on me a little bit for food? And if I stop and start, am I causing problems there? Yeah, our uh, um, our data would definitely suggest that this doesn't cause any problems. Uh, we see how birds come into gardens to use feeders when they need them, and then they they don't come into gardens when they don't need it. Um, and birds never u- lose the ability to forage <coughs> on on natural foods. Um, I would say really, you get these crunch points in the winter when maybe there's everywhere it's frozen it's extremely cold birds have extremely high energy use just to stay active um, and that's when they might really need those that extra food source just to make it through the day um, I would say in the summer in as a general rule um, you don't really get to the point where birds are hanging on to survival in that way um, and so you need that that extra bit of food so no I wouldn't worry too much about whether you put out food or not on a, on a particular day um, if the weather's nice and warm um, because birds will they'll learn about the different food sources and they'll use it if they need to mm-hmm. we touched on it slightly earlier um, about the kind of diseases that birds can pick up at feeders um, mm-hmm. I think good hygiene around your bird feeders is something most people know about um, is there anything that you can add to that what what, what should we be doing and what sh- indeed should we do if, if we do find sick birds yeah, so, so yes, you touched on hygiene um, and obviously um, making sure that your feeders are clean. And the other thing that you also touched on is about maybe if you put food out and the birds aren't taking it, um, that's something to be aware of um, And you, because you don't really want to leave food uneaten in the feeder for you know days and days at a time. So always putting out the amount of food that's going to be eaten within, you know, within a couple of days maximum. Um, so really tailoring the food that you're putting out to the rate that they're eating it at the time. Um, Another key thing about hygiene is also to think about the area where the feeders are, because obviously you can clean your feeders, but you can't really clean ground underneath them. And if you're, um, and if that sort of dropped food is building up on the ground all the time, and it isn't probably an area that you can clean, possibly if it's on paving slabs, you might be able to clean it, but if it's over soil, you can't clean it. So, um, if, if that's the case, it's a really good idea to rotate your feeders around to different areas of the garden um, uh, or stop feed, have, have several feeding spots and stop feeding at different spots at different times just to give that area on the ground a bit of a break because that's where birds can really um, transmit diseases to each other or diseases can build up under the feeder. Um, <clears throat> so that's something to, you know, that, that it would be really good if more people were conscious of this, of this good practice. Um, in terms of if you find a dead bird, um, certainly if you have a good reason to suspect that that's disease related. So obviously, if you find a dead bird underneath a window, you might think, well, it's probably you know, it's likely to have hit a window. Whereas if you see a sick bird 
or you know a bird that's lethargic um, in your garden around the feeder um, and then maybe find a dead bird um, you know not long after that you would probably assume that it was it was a sick bird we generally advise to stop feeding and to take the feeders down to obviously give them a good clean give it a little while um, to allow the birds to disperse because it's not really the case that the birds are getting diseases always from from the feeder. They're giving it to each other at while they are um, congregating at feeders. So, like I said, most of the time, birds can adapt really well to not having a particular food source for a little while. So, so we always advise just to stop feeding for a little bit. Um, you know, just stop that, break that cycle where you've got a sick bird that's hanging around at the feeder, which probably hangs around at the feeder because if it's sick because it can't it's, find, it's finding it hard to forage in other places if it's not got much energy um so so it's really you know try and break that cycle of the birds transmitting it to each other um and then obviously then reintroduce feeding um and if you get more sick birds around the feed or find more dead birds then you know stop feeding again but hopefully once you reintroduce feeding um you won't see this you won't see these problems um and also we have a project called um, Garden Wildlife Health, which is a website. And on that website, people can submit records of any birds or animals that they've seen. So it's not just birds. We collect records for um, amphibians and reptiles and hedgehogs and all these other things that you might see in your garden. Um, so you can report anything that you've seen. And you can also, um, if you've found anything um a dead bird you can actually say that you have a dead bird you found a dead bird um and then the, the these reports go off to the um, zoological society of london the vet the wildlife vets there and they might request the carcass mm-hmm. <laughs> um obviously if, <laughs> if it's um obviously if it's not been too long um and they, they obviously get back to you straight away and say okay please send in um the carcass um, i would say it's very important not to not to send a dead bird to anyone unless they specifically <laughs> ask for it <laughs> which is just a good rule about life in general I think. <laughs> so so we, we definitely don't want people sending in birds without you know if they're not expecting it so unsolicited say, birds no <laughs> yeah. uh, so many of my time i've had um <laughs> but yes yeah, so you can say to to the vets that are sell that you that um if you found a dead bird and they will say okay if they if they think it's worth investigating um they will they can ask for you to send it into them and then we'll then do a post-mortem and um obviously they'll report back to you to say um the cause of death if they can find it out particularly if it was a specific disease um they can then give you very specific advice about what actions to take so if they say it was this disease or if it didn't look like a disease um or what what the cause of death was um then obviously that will help you decide how to deal with um you know what actions to take in your garden and also um all this information is collected and collated together and so we can get a picture we can monitor outbreaks of disease across the country using this method so we do ask people to <coughs> even if they don't if they haven't found a dead bird um and they've just seen signs of disease in their gardens to report it um on the garden wildlife health website because that's really useful for us okay um you did actually talk about their uh, windows there and they are awful things sometimes for birds um mm. and i think probably mirrors in the garden are a problem um is there anything you can do to stop the birds flying into windows um only really the very common sense solutions um you know don't put a feeder very close to a window um just make the birds um give them the best chance possible to not fly into the window by, for example, making sure that there's there's things around the window. So maybe um, if if you can put things inside um, inside the window, um, try and block any line of sight through the window to another window. So because what birds will try and do is if they can see sky through a window, they'll think that it's an open space. So they'll try and fly straight through it. Um, so it's it's really hard. It depends on the layout of your of your room, but um, try and avoid that situation. Yeah, putting things around the outside of of the window. Um, you know, maybe sort of plants or shrubs that um, that maybe birds would fly onto. Because obviously, if a bird is very close to a window, they they can see it. 
Um, it, it ha- tends to be when they try and fly at the window from a distance, they, they can't tell when they start to fly towards it that there's something there. So just trying to break up the environment, both inside the window and maybe directly outside the window and not putting a feeder. So a feeder actually on the window um, is sometimes okay because obviously the birds are close enough to be able to see that it's a, a pane of glass. It's, when you've got a feeder maybe, you know, two metres away or three metres away, it's close enough that um, that they're, they're close to the window but far enough away for them to get a bit of speed up. So um, so trying to really have the feeders, you know, quite far away from the window is, is the best advice for them. Um, so if we don't want to necessarily put out bird feed um, or, 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 you know, feeders of any sort, if, mm-hmm. Can you think of sort of one or two top tips, especially for people who enjoy their gardens? What would be your best bet to get more birds into your garden? Um, so a couple of top tips, really. Um, the first one would be having, obviously, berry producing um, sort of bushes and plants. So rowan, um, a lot of cotoneaster bushes, um, you know, anything that's got berries, um, you know, apple trees um any kind of fruit tree really so these will attract birds in in the autumn and winter especially if you then leave obviously the fruits to fall um so that's a food source for birds obviously water um this is very much a, a common sense thing if you have um a bird bath um or any kind of watery feature in your garden um, that's going to attract the birds um i'd say the thing that is perhaps a bit that springs to mind slightly less um, is just having very dense um, structure, vegetation structure in your garden. Um, so really thick evergreen. I mean, the, the best thing really is ivy. Um, and I know a lot of gardeners maybe don't like ivy, but ivy is just an amazing plant for birds um, because it just provides, they, you know, they want somewhere to hide, they want somewhere to shelter. Um, in the um, in the winter, they need these structures. They need these shelters. And in the breeding season, they use them for breeding. Um, and of ivy also has the benefits that um, you've got those very late flowers that are amazing for pollinators. Um, and so you get a lot of insect insect life in your garden, which is obviously amazing. That it's a food source for birds. And then you've got the berries as well. Um, so so that kind of really thick structure climbers. Um, you know, anything where the birds might nest and hide is really a great thing to have for birds. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm a fan of ivy all round, really. So <laughs> that works for me. Um, yeah. So you were talking earlier about the, the, a few of the trends that you'd spotted. So just to finish up, could you maybe give us a sort of overall view of maybe the past 40 years and what trends you've seen? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to, just to you know, <laughs> summarise the last 40 years, if you could, in a couple of sentences. Yeah, so 40 years. Um, so it used to be to put out things like peanuts and maybe, you know, those coconut shells filled with fat. And those really only appeal to a very few birds. So you'd get your, your blue tits and your great tits. Um, and that was what people thought of as garden birds. Whereas over the last, few decades people are putting out such a wide range of foods and um more natural kinds of seeds and that's appealed to things like green finches gold finches red poles all of these things that weren't really garden birds in the past and now they've really adapted to using um using gardens using human food sources Um, at the same time we've obviously seen a lot of declines in things that used to be um garden birds and you know one that springs to mind the spot of flycatcher um a lot of our migrant birds so you touched at the start on these warblers that you'd seen so you've got chiff tass willow warblers um obviously we've got swallows and swift and house martins and all these things that we're used to seeing around our gardens um and a lot of these birds that, that migrate um tend to be in trouble and we're seeing those big declines in those so that's that's um not the um you know not not a great thing to see obviously it's very sad um there are things we can do to help in terms of um 
providing nesting sites, you know, for things like house sparrows, which are declining, for things like house martins. Um, you know, it's very difficult to convince swifts to nest in buildings, um, to nest in new sites, but providing swift sites is something that people can do. Um, so those are, those are some changes, you know, things that people can do around their homes as well. Mm hmm. Can uh, you also um, answer a question I might have about magpies, which is um, I have people who sort of talk to me about magpies and they say, oh, I hate magpies. They eat all the songbird chicks. And mm-hmm. you know, is there any truth in that or are they just opportunists that are kind of proliferating because there are other, other birds declining? Um, so there's, there's truth in the fact that magpies do obviously um, eat chicks. Um, that is one of their food sources. Um, so if you, you know, if, if you really don't like the fact that they do that, then that's obviously a valid reason not to like them because that is something that they do. There isn't any evidence on, um, on a national scale that increases in magpies or sparrowhawks, all these other birds, um, are driving the population declines of, um, smaller birds. We actually did some research, um, a few years ago where we looked at, um, you know, on particular, it broke it down to particular sites, um, and there was no, there was no evidence that um, at a site level, um, sort of increases in birds such as magpies would actually um, make smaller bird populations decline. So the fact that um, magpie populations have increased and smaller birds have declined, and that's happened over the same, you know, time period, um, that's, you know, th- these are driven by different things. So we can't find any evidence to say that they are causing national scale declines in other bird populations. These are obviously, um, it is normal. It's very normal for um, uh, for nests of birds to be predated. Um, obviously, most birds make several nesting attempts um, in the breeding season. They'll obviously breed over, you know, the course of many years. Um, you know, they expect, um, in an evolutionary sense, they expect that most breeding attempts um, will not be successful, um, just be- and they are adapted to living with predator populations. This is this is the normal way of things. Um, so that is that is um, that is normal. Um, obviously, um, it, it's not very pleasant, and if you see it happening, um, you know it's obviously quite natural to, to be upset by you know if you actually see this happening in front of your eyes. But people tend to make a link between what they're seeing in front of their eyes and national population declines, and we've not found that link to be there. Okay. Good. Thank you. I like magpies, so I'm pleased to hear that. (laughs) Brilliant. All right. Well, um, so, Kate, if people want to join up to the Skate, to Garden Bird Watch, how would they go about it? Yeah, so they can go onto the BTO website, uh, British British Stressful Anthology, um, and just search for the BTO, search for BTO Garden Bird Watch, and they can go onto our website and um, join in. Like I said, it's £17 um, for the year, but you do get a book, a really um, great book on garden wildlife when you join and you get a magazine and you get to start um, entering the data on your garden and joining that community of garden bird watchers. So people can join online or they can give us a call. Well, thank you, Kate, for sharing your expertise. And if you'd like to find out how you can take part in the Garden Bird Watch or more about the BTO, I've put links in the show notes. Kate would like to credit the following people with the research she mentioned. The black cat migration research and research on the effect of bird feeding was led by Dr Kate Plummer at BTO. The garden disease research was led by Dr Becky Lawson at ZSL. The research on how predators affect bird populations was led by Dr Stuart Newson at BTO. Thanks very much for listening and I'll catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.